political platform, and then I'm going to move to the principles. So I'm going to skip through this, but I believe that some of these nuggets are relevant for today, for this day and time now. I believe that some of these nuggets, if you catch it by the Spirit, you can see true prophecy from false prophecy. Some things that God shows prophets in the past is not for them to market when it happens now. Can I submit to you that whenever a prophet begins to remind us of the judgment that he saw in the past and don't give us options, he's moving out of the order of the prophetic call. Notice that the David seer, Gad, did not just give him prophetic judgment. He says, here are the options you need to do to resolve this judgment. We don't need prophets to tell us what they saw. We need prophets to give us the options of the Lord to stop what's going on. Somebody said, we need prophets to give us options. The assignment of a prophet is to give you options, is to give you, this is thus said the Lord, but here's what you need to do to resolve it. And we have a lot of people that are going back into what they saw years ago, but the question is, what are the options? How can we stop what's going on now? Notice this, notice what Gad says, that Gad came to David and told him, said to him, shall seven years of famine come into your land? Now I want you to see this. God is judging David. David was God's anointed servant. David was the man after God's own heart. David heard from God. David also knew how to worship before God. We're talking about a culture that begins to bring the kingdom of God back down. And I'm going to share with you that we, the, what we need in this day and time now is a kingdom culture that's creating kingdom worshipers. David was a worshiper. Everybody said David was a worshiper. But even though he was a worshiper, there were still some things in the spirit that he did not see. Even though he heard from God, there were still some things that God concealed from him. He still needed a prophet on the side to guide him. And so God raised up this man named Gad, and the Bible says Gad began to reveal to David certain options that he had to pick because of his sin, because of his iniquity. And the scripture says, shall seven years of famine come to you in the land? That's number one. Or will you flee three months before your enemies as they pursue you? Number two, third option, door door number three. Or shall there be three days of pestilence in your land? So here are three options. I will give you three years of famine where all your people will suffer. I will give you also three months where the enemy will pursue you and you will have to hide in caves. Or you can have three days of plague where I will send a contagious disease in the land. Which one do you want, David? I'm doing this because you did something that was contrary to my will. And it was not you that started it. It was the nation of Israel. Because of their rebellious acts, they started it. I want you you to catch it. And so what God did, God sent a plague in the land. Someone said, this is going to be relevant. Now watch David's response. I'm going too quick. Watch this. Watch David's response. Now consider this and decide what answer I should return to him who sent me. Look at that. Look at that. David, pick a choice. And I'm going to go back into the courts of God and tell God your choice. Wait a minute. I thought David can talk to God by himself. There are certain dimensions in God you need someone to go before you and share something with God for. And watch this. Now watch this. Then David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Watch the the response. Let us fall into the hands of the Lord for his mercies are great. But do not let me fall into the hand of of man. Watch this. Watch this. David said, I don't know what choice to pick. But to you, O Lord, I commend my spirit. I know that I'm wrong. I know that I should be penalized, but Lord, you decide for me. What happens when there is a certain thing that happens in the land, a a catastrophic emotion or a catastrophic event that happens in the land, what happens is we run to man instead of just surrendering to God. A worshiper knows how to surrender to God in the midst of crisis. A worshiper knows how to repent and how to become broken and yield to God even when they don't know why the situation is happening. David said, I commend my spirit to you. I put my hands into your hands. Watch this. God decided to bring the famine. And the scripture says for three days this famine killed 70,000 military men. The very men that David counted. The very men that David trusted. God killed 70,000 of them. Because he was putting his hope in men instead of God. 
Can I submit to you the reason why certain things are happening is because God is trying to awaken us not to put our strength and hope in man, but to trust him. God is setting some things down because he is requiring worship. God, watch this, God is causing things to happen so we can begin to plead upon his mercy. And when the church learns how to yield themselves to God and put their life in God's hand, he turns things around. So I said, God is about to turn things around. Now, move quickly. Here's, now watch verse 2 Samuel 24. I'm going to have to move this quick for me because I'm going too quick. Watch this. Now, verse 16. When the avenging angel, is everybody with me? Look at verse 16. When the avenging angel, Amplified Virgin, stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to what? The Lord relented from the disaster and said to the angel who destroyed the people, it is enough. Now relax your hand. Oh my God. I want you to see something. The result, the consequence of God was a plague. It was a disease that could not be cured. But when we look in verse 16, we don't see that it was a demon that did it. We don't see that it was a devil that did it. It was the angel of judgment. And the plague was a sign of his sword. Come my son, tell it in your shade. Did I, do y'all see that? The Bible says God looked at the angel and saw 70,000 men dying by one angel's sword. And God had pity and said, enough. Can I submit to you that we need to get into a place of worship where we can get God to say enough? Because if God don't say enough, the angel's going to still be killing. You think it's COVID-19, but it's really the sword of the angel. God said enough. It was because of one sin. It was because God was angry at one nation. God brought this judgment. Now watch this. This is confusing. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Arana. Now, I want you to circle the word Arana because Arana is a title. It's not the name of the man. His name is Arnon. You would understand this in 1 Chronicles 21. His name is really Arnon. Arana is a royal name, a royal title, which means I shall shout for joy. Arana, he was the king of the Jebusites. But his name in Arnon, which means perpetual light. Catch me. The angel was at a threshing floor of a man that, na- that name was Perpetual Light. His name was Perpetual Light, and he was a king of the Jebusites. You got it. It's only when you get into a realm of light that you can get God to have mercy. Wait a minute, watch this, watch this. He's at a threshing floor, and he's doing all this judgment at this threshing floor. We'll get back to it. When David saw the angel who was striking down the people, he spoke to the Lord and said, Behold, I I alone am the one who has sinned and done wrong. But the sheep, people of Israel, what have they done to you? Now watch this. So here David begins to look up and God opens his eyes to see that it was an angel bringing the pestilence. To see that it was an angel being the plague. And when David saw it through the Spirit of God, he began to repent. He began to humble himself before God. That's what a true worshiper does. A true worshiper knows how to become broken before God. When they're diseased, they don't don't spit and put on the elevator buttons. They don't don't spit on on bicycle wheels and 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 we go to the subway and spit on the seat so other people can get it. No. Some of you... To my wife or something, we, we need to start wearing some latex gloves at the gas station. <laughs> David said, listen, I'm wrong. All, this is, all of this is happening because of me. So he becomes broken before God. And watch this. The text tells us in verse number 18. Is everybody with me? Please let your hand be only against me and my father's house. Then Gad, the prophet, came to David that day and said to him, Go up. Someone say, go up. Set up an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite where you saw the angel. Can I submit to you the only way that God will begin to change things in the nation, change things in in the society, is when we begin to worship. It is only when we build an altar to worship God that he stops plagues. 
that he stops certain things from happening. It is only when we get back to the heart of worship that God changes things. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, it's time to build an altar. Say it again. Say, it's time to build an altar. We're going to get all into this thing. Here it is. So David went up according to Gad's word as the Lord commanded him. Now, I want you to highlight this word threshing floor because threshing floor is very important. Highlight that because we have to deal with this when we talk about creating a kingdom culture of true worshipers. We have to deal with that. Now, 2 Samuel 24, 22 to 25. Here's the last part of this whole context, and then we're about to move into this lesson. Arana said to David, let my Lord, the king, take up and offer whatever seems good to him. Look, here are oxen for the burnt offering and threshing sledges and the yokes of the oxen for the wood. Arana, or not, he was shocked that David was coming to his land. He was shocked that David was coming to his home. So he respected the king so much that he says, King, if you need anything, I will take care of you. I'm your God. I'm your destiny helper. If you need any offering, any sacrifice, just depend on me. I, I got you. Notice the response of David. Verse 23, all of this, O king, Arana gives to the king. And Arana said to the king, may the Lord your God be favorable to you. But, verse 24, but the king said to Arana, no. Someone said no. But I will certainly buy it from you for a what? I will buy it from you for a price. How like that? I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, which costs me nothing. So David purchased the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. David built what? David built what? David was a king. David was the king of the kingdom of Israel. And when he built an altar there, he was bringing a kingdom culture in that environment that the Jebusites ruled. We're getting somewhere. Watch this. So the Lord was moved to compassion by David's prayer for the land. And what happened? What happened when he built that altar? Can I submit to you when the church gets back to true worship, when the church gets back not focusing on materialistic things, but focusing on God, God will move the plan. Now, since God is eternal, since God is transcendent, and he does not, he does not revolve himself in time, we must understand the attributes of God in his eternality. God in his eternality does not move in what we call kairos motion. He moves in chronos. Chronos is the Greek word that means time unspecified. And it's God that moves in the place that does not subject him to calendars, that does not subject him to hours and minutes and seconds. God moves into a place that is not bound by times and season. And when we deal with God's transcendence, we must understand that God wants to have relationship with us. And since he wants to have relationship with anthropological beings, he decides to move in time based upon how we worship him. Watch this here. God, he decides to move and he chooses to have a relationship with us above all creation. It is anthropological beings that know how to define and describe God. It is not animals that know how to describe God. It is anthropological beings. It is human beings that have been given access to begin to glorify God through vocabulary, through their image and likeness, and through their characteristic expression before God. And it is through the anthropology of man that we begin to understand how to give God proper doxology. Doxology is the way that we worship God. It is the way that we adore God. And God, watch this, he uses the doxology of man to come down in imminence and begin to move with us in time, space, and matter. But if there is no worship, God does not move in time, space, and matter. It takes a man to worship God that would get God to come down from Kronos into Kairos and turn situations around. Stay with me real quick and I'm going to go into practicality. But I got to deal with this one theory. Amen. Now, when we understand something about God, it is only worship that attracts God to move out of eternality in the moment. Someone say it is only worship that causes God to move out of eternality into the moment. And one of the tools that God uses to come down from transcendency to imminence is an altar. An altar is a symbol of worship. An altar gets God to be anchored to move in time. And whenever there is an altar being placed and being built, 
God comes down and he stays there. The altar is like an anchor weight on God. God moves swiftly because God does not bound, he be, is not bound in time. God is not subjected to seconds or nanoseconds. But when we build an altar, we chain God to a particular place. And the Bible tells us that when we talk about altars, altars is a symbol of sacrifice. Altar is a symbol of where we adore God. An altar is a symbol of how we define who we are grateful for. When we talk about an altar, we're talking about one of the major tools that a worshiper uses. And when we de define worship, worship is us giving adoration to a God that we believe exists. Worship is us trusting in God's attributes. When we talk about the attributes of God, we're talking about God being a faithful God. God being a God that is kind. God being a God that is good. God being a God, watch this, that's far beyond our imagination. When we trust in this God, then we are considered to be worshipers. Worshippers are those that are willing to let go of anything that hinders their relationship with their superior source. Worship is the very thing that brings the evidence that the kingdom is manifested. Where there is no worship, there is no kingdom. Someone says, where there's no worship, there is no kingdom. Worship is the evidence that the kingdom of God is manifested. When we are not creating a culture of worship, the kingdom is not here. It is only when we begin to create a culture of worship that we see healing, that we see deliverance, that we see breakthrough, that we see God's mercy in action. When there is no worship, God does not bring his kingdom to invade the environment. It takes worship, it takes people that are giving themselves to a place, that are, are, are subjecting themselves to a place called the altar that calls God to come down from heaven and bring forth his kingdom results. Can I submit to you that when you begin to worship God, when you begin to adore God, God gives you revelation concerning the benefits that you need. We all have certain problems. We all have certain complexities. We all have certain difficulties. But when we begin to worship, God begins to give us revelation concerning his kingdom so that we may obtain the benefit. Look at your name and say, neighbor, you don't have no other problem but a revelation problem. When revelation is unveiled, when revelation is disclosed, it causes something to happen within your spirit that gives God ultimate glory and worship. When God begins to reveal to you who he is, you can't help but worship him. Could it be the reason why we are not worshiping God is because we're not moving by revelation? Could it be the reason why we don't have revelation is because our worship is not high enough. But when the church begins to worship God, God gives us revelation where we walk by faith and not by sight. Many people that are walking by the circumstances around them, they are absent and void of revelation. Revelation brings you into a place of awareness that God wants to spend time with you and he wants to work things out on your behalf. Because why? He cares for you. He loves you and he adores you. God wants to have relationship with you. Look at your name and say, neighbor, God wants to have a relationship with me. So we must understand that we must get back into a culture of worship to ignite intimacy in the hearts of humans to begin to glorify God. Because if God is not glorified, what he does is he sends judgment. What he does is he sends restraint until men get back to a place where they call upon him. Because the ultimate purpose for man was to give God glory. And whenever we do not give God glory, he starts affecting things. Whenever we do not give God glory, he starts messing with things. Because he wants to have relationship with anthropology. Can I submit to you that your worship, your doxology, your way of expressing your gratitude, gratitude towards God cannot be acceptable if you have a truncated theology. If you have, watch this, if you have an eschewed theology, a theology that does not give God proper recognition, your worship will be off. And many people, they try to worship God without studying God. That's all theology means is to study God. It, that's all it means. It's the logic of God. It's the mind of God. And whenever you don't have a sound theology, I guarantee your worship.